um, just to start, um, uh, I'm giving you something which I've uh, prepared actually five years ago anyway. Uh, it seems that things doesn't change, doesn't seem to change, particularly in terms of Hong Kong's role. Uh, but uh, to, for my understanding, there are quite a lot of interesting questions raised. Uh, there seems to be an assumption that uh, there's a blueprint in Beijing highlighting which company, which projects uh, are qualified as BRI projects. But from our own experience, when we ask for that, uh, there's actually none. Uh, and that's why we come to the conclusion and the way we see the bear and roll in this way, which is, it is something of China's globalization initiative. Uh, it seems to be initiated by the government, but uh, it can be done by everybody. Uh, the only thing is that uh, China has come to a point that it need to further globalize itself, not just in trade and manufacturing. Uh, but also in, in terms of economics and social and all, uh, all different aspects. And that's how we see it and why we think Hong Kong has a major role to play in this process. Uh, as raised by many of the speakers just now that there are many problems in when the Chinese go overseas, either it's a government, uh, state-owned enterprises, private enterprises or quasi uh, private enterprises. Uh, the first thing is that they lack of intellectual expertise, uh, uh, experience, but not just because they are uh, seldomly overseas. In fact, quite a number of Chinese companies are pretty international already, but they always go by themselves. And that is a major, major problem when we see it. When you go international, you can't just go by yourself. You need to have the involvement at least of the counterparty or the host countries uh, that you're going into. It needs to be owned the, the project, not just by the investors, but also by the, the host of the investment. So how to mobilize other international parties to join, including the host country, to join those investment or projects is critical. And that's where Hong Kong's uh, can contribute. The second issue is that so much of those initiatives is driven, seem to be driven by the government. And people, people will ask that to what extent is uh, economically or financially sustainable, socially sustainable, and uh, financially sustainable. Um, to a large extent, I think that uh, this can be resolved by making better use of the market forces. That's another area where Hong Kong can play an interesting role. And the first thing, of course, is about all kinds of risks, from financial risk to operating risk, to political risk, social risk, and environmental risk, and uh, so on and so forth. Here, we have some experience to, uh, to share. And let me elaborate in different sectors how these uh, three key elements uh, Hong Kong can participate and contribute. First, in terms of international participation, Hong Kong is one of the most international cities, uh, not just in Asia, but I could say that it's in, uh, around the world. Uh, it's not so much just in terms of the number of foreign offices we have or foreign companies we have. It's close to 4,000 companies. Um, but this is a place which are certainly recognized as with the largest uh, presentation of foreign governments also. Aside from the key capitals of the world, like Beijing, Washington, uh, London, and Moscow, <clears throat> if talk about long capital cities, the number of consulates or government rep, rep office here in Hong Kong, we have 100, 122. There's only one other cities around the world which are long uh, country capital with slightly more representative than us in Hong Kong. And that city is New York which is quite unfair because we know that the UN headquarters is based in uh, New York. So almost all the countries in the world have to have some somebody there. Other than that, this is the city where you have the most government rep representatives, as well as the company representatives. We have half a million of foreign residents, 7 million for our business visitors each, uh, each year, close to the population of the city itself. So this is a major hub uh, where you can connect both uh, 
uh, <clears throat> in government terms and first in business terms. Um, we have uh, 13,000 business association members who are linked to Hong Kong around the world in more than 30 countries. So this is the international world network where we can draw in. And I give you some experience about how we leverage on that uh, connections. Uh, we have been holding a Bell and Road Summit uh, every year uh, since 2017. Uh, and each year we have about from 2,500 uh, 2, to 5,200 attendants. And these are people who are business people who are looking for business opportunities rather than those who are attending big conferences in el elsewhere, particularly in Beijing. Uh, many of those are government officials. And the one who are most uh, <clears throat> eager and active in supporting and joining in those summit, you'll be surprised that uh, countries or companies from countries which are absent from the Ban Road Initiative, namely some of the big Western countries like uh, the US, Japan and the others. So this is a place where you can meet the business without too much interference from the government policy and politics. The second thing about Hong Kong's international connection is about the investment flows. Uh, we know that Bear and, uh, <coughs> Bear and Road involve a lot of investment, uh, not, not simply by the Chinese uh, mainland, but also from all parts of the world. Uh, we can't afford to have China investing by itself and hope that that will be uh, okay everywhere. Hong Kong actually is the number four largest outward investment sources in the world. Next, just to mainland, only in uh, late last uh, 2018, before that, actually Hong Kong is number, uh, number two, next only to the US. So this is a place where everybody use to invest across border. And that's the same for the mainland Chinese who, who want to invest across the border. Um, this third uh, area of internationalization is uh, uh, talking about finance. When you go overseas, you need to be supported by financing. Either you raise money, you borrow money, or you use different uh, uh, currencies to, uh, to invest across. There are trades, there are investment, there are uh, other flows you need to cater for. And Hong Kong is top in many of these areas. We are the largest IPO center for raising funds through the stock market. We are the largest RMB center also. We are the, large, uh, the fourth largest trading center. In fact, we are the third largest US dollar forex trading center in the world. Uh, we trade every year, uh, every day, half as much as the whole US uh, market is. And we have, uh, we are the seventh largest banking center, second largest asset management center in Asia, second largest private equity center in Asia, all, all this. So this is a place uh, there you can find a lot of funding sources and different ways of funding and supporting your cross-border activities. Um, <clears throat> and one thing particular about the Bear and Road is that a lot of people uh, think that Bear and Road is made mainly about infrastructure. I would say that it is only the starting point uh, because you have to have infrastructure or the basic infrastructure before you can do a lot of other things. Infrastructure is, um, uh, is a major contribution from the Chinese part, from the uh, high-speed rail to airports, um, even subways and ports, power plants, all those things. But Hong Kong is good, not so much in just building infrastructure, but to manage infrastructure. Uh, our airport authority manage more than the Hong Kong airport, which is already the largest in, in terms of air flight and the third largest in terms of air passenger. Uh, we also manage uh, airport in Shanghai, Hangzhou, and uh, Zhuhua. Many of those are mainly exposure in mainland. But for the other areas of infrastructure, we have a lot of exposure across the world, um, uh, around the world. In terms of uh, subway and railway, our uh, <coughs> subway system, uh, our railway company actually manage railways, not just in the mainland, but also in Sweden, UK, Australia. Two of our major port uh, companies or holding companies actually uh, <clears throat> have exposure or own ports and run ports in more than 26 countries 
close to 100 ports around the world. You name it, every major port around the world, they have some port specificity managed by one of the two Hong Kong companies here. Uh, power plant is another area. We're not just good in building power, but also in running and managing power in China, in India, in Taiwan, Indonesia, and Australia. And telecom is another area which uh, we are uh, very strong in branching around the world. So these are the things which can uh, help and contribute to the Bell and Road area. Uh, it's not just getting the fund to, uh, to build and have the technology to build it, but have the management expertise to run it. And many of these infrastructure services uh, we have in Hong Kong is some of the most efficient as well as the most profitable. And most of those are actually not run just by the government, but, all, but mainly by the private sector. Uh, our port authority, uh, uh, our port companies are basically private. Our power company, our telecom, our telecom system are all built by private companies. So these are the uh, <coughs> expertise we can offer and contribute. Imagine that if the Chinese investment in port and power and telecoms are all overseas, are run by private company, not just from China, but all around the world, including Hong Kong, including the US or, or, uh, or, or so and so, so forth, so and so forth, then um, the efficiency, the kind of risk they will encounter will be much less than what you have seen so far. Logistics is also another area. Uh, I have uh, covered that uh, slightly, but um, the good thing about Hong Kong is that it is one of the few free ports we have, free in terms of not just goods, but capital information services and uh, tenant flows. And it is one of the independent tariff area, even if it's not recognized by US now, but uh, uh, the latest changes in US uh, uh, treatment with Hong Kong only do it in the labor market, but they didn't touch on our uh, WTO uh, uh, <coughs> treatments. Uh, so we are still actually practically and in government terms, still in dependent tariff area, even in the US uh, uh, situation. Uh, given that the uh, one country, two system uh, status, we have uh, independent uh, uh, authority to come to uh, conclude a lot of economic and financial agreements. Uh, with different bodies, including 165 countries where we are we are granted visa fee. Uh, this is important in uh, some areas like e even uh, the <coughs> Central Asia and some of the developing countries where Hong Kong have not so much of exposure. One of my experience uh, uh, is in one of the Central Asia countries, which is being pined as a key bank role uh, country. And when Mao researchers suggest that we should uh, go there to uh, understand more about the pace, to what extent we can complement or support and uh, participate in some of the beyond road projects. I'm sending one of my researchers from Hong Kong there and one of my colleagues from the mainland China also want to join it. Uh, at the end of the day, after two months of the study, my colleague has come back and finished his report my colleague in mainland China is still applying for the visa. Uh, and even after he get the visa, he has to fly from uh, the place where he was located to Beijing or one other cities before he can catch a flight to that Central Asia country where Hong Kong has direct flight and visa fee arrangements. So these are some of the uh, advantages you can see which can complement and make Hong Kong contribute more even for those from mainland China. One last thing I want to touch about is about professional services. Uh, not only that we have some quite a uh, uh, large amount of uh, professionals, but many of our professional bodies follow uh, with international standards in, form, uh, in terms of finance, accounting, uh, as well as legal and consultancy and all these other things. Uh, one latest uh, <coughs> organization I participate in uh, one of the functions is about the survey business, uh, with land and uh, property surveys. In fact, they are one of the largest uh, in the, uh, membership around the world outside the host country itself. 
many of our international, uh, our international professional body actually have membership, which are some of the largest around the world. And they follow some, uh, and they <coughs> command quite a lot of uh, influence in setting those international uh, standards. So these are things I want to highlight. And uh, to sum up, these are different areas where, we, uh, where Hong Kong contribute. I can't give you too much uh, examples because um, uh, the first thing is that it's hard to define what is bare role. But to be honest, all the companies we involve are major to small companies, uh, which I, uh, uh, we have in contact with locally or uh, uh, globally. Uh, many of them are actually have participated in one way or another of the uh, Bear Road project. Uh, just to name one thing, uh, one example, many people believe that SMEs uh, being small and medium and with uh, that much resources, it's hard to participate in Bear Road big projects. Uh, to, to some extent, that may be true, but uh, in the case of Hong Kong, you may be wrong. Uh, I met one with two guys uh, from the finance industry, which are very young bank, uh, bankers. They uh, told me that uh, they have been doing quite well in quite a number of uh, South Asian countries where uh, there are a lot of bad road uh, projects. Uh, what they're doing is that they bring along Hong Kong's experience in some of the uh, uh, microfinancing, which Hong Kong is not as strong in any way, but uh, being a hub in the world uh, and a financial center, they learn a lot of how other people are doing it. And they take it to some of the smaller countries and support with the local government uh, how to do use microfinancing to make the Bear Road project there one of the major port uh, development project uh, to be uh, <coughs> uh, uh, supported by the local entrepreneurs. So they get the funding from here and support those uh, uh, farmers in, a, in the uh, near the port so that they can support the beer now and can profit from it. So things like that, actually, once you have a big project, there are a lot of smaller projects and many of the SMEs who are smart enough and uh, flexible enough could uh, benefit from it. And here in Hong Kong, we try to dis, uh, get these connections and uh, bring in all different participants to mitigate different risk as well as to make it more international. So hopefully that can give you a broad idea of how we're doing and what uh, Hong Kong can contribute. Great, thanks Nick for that introduction. Um, so uh, Angela, you, you have a question. Why don't you ask your question? Okay, uh, I just wanted to ask, thank you Nicholas for the great presentation and um, I wanted to ask to which extent can Hong Kong promote sustainable investments through its green finance program, so the green bonds and um, do you have any example of this? Uh, Hong Kong, um, <clears throat> the monetary authority itself has actually set up a special group to promote green financing. Uh, there are a number of um, uh, programs that have been uh, uh, undergoing, including promoting green bond issues. Uh, in fact, um, the treasury side has actually offered some incentives, tax incentives for green bond issues. And there's an uh, association, green, bond associ uh, green finance association, who are trying to set up uh, standards uh, because uh, everybody can call themselves green, but on honestly, uh, to what extent is truly green. Uh, standards is some key, uh, ingredients in developing this uh, sector. And uh, the, I understand the Green Finance Association is doing it. Uh, and Hong Kong HKMA is support, in supporting of that. Um, our Green Finance Initiative is not primarily for the bear role itself, but definitely anyone who are in the bear role who use Hong Kong platform, we're happy to see that. And once we have that platform built up, I think it's much easier uh, to say, see uh, more actual projects. In fact, in one of our major, <clears throat> uh, in last year when we have our Bear and Roll Summit uh, con uh, conference where, where we attended by 5,200 people around the world, uh, we have a special section on green financing. Um, and I forget the participant, I think uh, easily it's about 200 of them anyway. Great. Uh, Barry. You want to ask your question? 
Well, the uh, U.S. and, and its uh, anti-Belt and Road campaign is, of course, uh, targeted uh, Chinese companies, uh, particularly those involved in uh, building and managing ports uh, and other kinds of infrastructure projects. Uh, Hong Kong is uh, very big in terms of port industry, but in lots of different aspects of infrastructure. So has Hong Kong also uh, been a target or has there been a, some kind of distinction made between uh, Chinese mainland companies and Hong Kong companies in that regard? Uh, uh, and also look, looking yeah. forward, especially because, I mean, this, all these changes are so new with the response to the Security Act. Is there concern in Hong Kong that they're gonna now face a lot more obstacles from the uh, US and other places? Uh, that's actually where we see our opportunities, actually. Uh, there's no, nothing is non-controversial, but um, I would qualify uh, Barry's question as the U.S. is uh, more or less the current U.S. government rather than the U.S. as a whole. Because now, uh, Bear and Road prom promotion activities, we actually have uh, a lot of very enthusiastic U.S. participants. Uh, including many of the big names uh, everybody knows about. Um, uh, same for the Japanese side, actually. These are the two key countries where the government doesn't seem to be very enthusiastic and sometimes when, uh, a, a bit hostile uh, about the bad road. Uh, I can understand uh, politically why uh, they think so, but um, imagine you are one of the major companies in these countries where you see a lot of opportunities uh, in participating or, uh, in these bear and row activities, uh, what will you do is not probably come up openly and say that I support it, but at least privately they are very eager. In fact, some of our major sponsors of our bear and row activities are the US and Japanese companies. Uh, of course, I'm not going to disclose the names anyway, but uh, so to, we have to make a differentiation. There, uh, there are a lot of people who are still very uh, yeah, interest and see that actually it's not just to the benefit, but to, to the benefit of all those parties involved as well as to the development of many of the developing countries. They have a lot of expertise, which I think is very important, uh, particularly in terms of support. Uh, if you go into details, I give you one uh, example, which is January, and then pick it up you know, when I'm touring around US, talking about Baron Road two years ago. And uh, one of the y, uh, VP of that uh, top uh, Fortune top 50 country uh, company told me that uh, the Baron Road project is the biggest project they have around the world uh, of the whole company. Uh, and they do that, uh, they participate in that. It's not in port, but uh, in some of the infrastructure area. Uh, they have, uh, this US companies is very strong and basically number one in that area of their expertise. And there's no way that any project in that size will, uh, can go along without their participation. Uh, they are very happy to participate. And they do that even to the extent that, that they move one of the key uh, <clears throat> officials who run the Asia operation from one location to Hong Kong, because they think, they say that this is a project where involving some of the developing countries as well as China, mainland China. They need someone who is not sitting in mainland China to manage it, because uh, China have a lot of restrictions in terms of visa, uh, telecommunication, and all those things. It is a, a place where they can communicate easily with the mainland as well as that host country of the investment. And they choose Hong Kong. So that is the kind of involvement many of the US company actually has. And it is uh, public knowledge actually around the US uh, for many of the business people. So I hope that example can explain to you the reality of what is in the business world versus what is uh, we hear about from the government. Alicia, do you want to ask a question? You need to unmute. Yes, uh, thank you, Albert. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. A very Hi. interesting presentation on uh, the role of Hong Kong. I'll be following up with some numbers on, on that in a minute. Hmm. I, I have a question on 
how you think, uh, this is a policy question, Hong Kong could preserve its role. I mean, I'm going to argue later that unfortunately, although the size of the market is humongous, uh, Hong Kong has not yet really reaped the benefits of being the most obvious offshore center. But it, it, it might not be about Hong Kong. The reality is that, you know, there, there was massive, literally massive domestic financing. So in a way, no need. But this is changing because China is retrenching in terms of cross-border lending and thus there may be more opportunities for Hong Kong. But it so happens that now we have this difficult situation with regard to the US and mm -hmm. and increasingly the, 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 the question mark is, will Hong Kong be considered, as you said, an independent, maybe independent is not, you know, like a, a different, a, 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 a different jurisdiction, let's put it this way, as yeah. regards trade and investment. So as we all know, Hong Kong has FTAs with countries all over. I mean, can Hong Kong do more about that, especially on bilateral investment agreements? Because I think mm -hmm. that could, in a way, protect Hong Kong somehow from new waves. And how do you see in your role this happening? Okay. Um, in terms of, uh, okay, the two aspects I want to respond to your question. One is about official documents, agreements, that can enhance or raise our uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the perception of Hong Kong being involved, like feature agreements, bilateral investment agreements, uh, service trade agreements, uh, all kinds of things. We are doing more about that, uh, uh, not TDC, but the government itself. Uh, TDC have no role in, 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 in this process because we are not government body. Uh, uh, the government, as, uh, as we understand, is working on, on that, but uh, we also have to be realistic that we have only a very small team of expertise in that, and we are new to it. Uh, our first FTA is uh, done in 2003 during SARS when we have the SIPA with China. And at that time, we don't even know that to what extent we can sign this kind of ag agreement. Um, so since then, we have built up more and more about that. Uh, but if you look at it, except for SIPA and hopefully with the ASEAN feature agreement, um, we can't expect too much from this feature agreement to achieve because Hong Kong being a free port, uh, in terms of merchandise trade, we don't have much to offer. Uh, everybody will come to us and say that you already uh, zero tariffs. So what I'm going to benefit if I sign a trade agreement with you and you will ask for lower tariffs for your product to uh, move to my market. So our attraction is more on the services and investment. And as I said, we are the, last, the fourth largest investment hub around the world. Everybody is very keen. They're not necessarily for our investment to go into their place, but for them to use our investment platform here to raise funds. So these are the issues which we are focusing on. And to be honest, a lot of those actually is not so much of an investment uh, protection agreement that can help. Because, um, <clears throat> for instance, for companies who want to come to our stock market to raise funds, it's more towards the regulatory area of the security sector that matters, rather than an investment protection agreement as, um, as such. And quite a lot of those actually have subscribed to the basic investment protection uh, uh, <coughs> promises already. So I would say that we will uh, go on one hand that we'll push for more of those, uh, but it will take time and you will uh, probably bear foot in um, uh, 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 gradually. The other way is that we try to secure more business deals for particular companies. I would have to warn you that don't look for a time where you have a list of Hong Kong companies with all the big BL, BRI projects on their hands. Uh, it very much depends on how you see what is Hong Kong company. Give me, I give, let me give you a, uh, an example. We have one of the largest banks in the world um, based here, but they don't headquarter here. You know which bank we hear this anyway. Many of our big, huge corporate are not actually domiciled in Hong Kong. Um, 
So it's very difficult to imagine a KL situation where you would say a Hong Kong company secure a deal and manage or uh, host a deal like what you see now in the state company of China. Uh, and even uh, some of the big Chinese companies, as uh, just mentioned, uh, all three of the biggest Chinese uh, telecom companies, uh, some of the biggest port companies have uh, listed in Hong Kong and you have uh, located the international headquarters in Hong Kong. But once they have a deal, it will be recognized as a deal done by a China company rather than a Hong Kong company. So we are not looking for that, actually. We are looking for actual business transactions using the Hong Kong platform, no matter whether it's the trade, investment, securities, or technology um, type of things. And sometimes it's difficult to quantify in that sense. Uh, we try to come up with a number and say that how much of this done is, uh, this trade is done by Hong Kong uh, uh, with the BRI. Uh, I would want you that that is not going to give you anything, uh, any excitement in that way. But we'd like to see more and more connections being built. Uh, in fact, one more example I, I can raise is that when in our first Bear and Road Summit, where the, uh, <clears throat> uh, the Chinese par uh, parliament uh, president come uh, to deliver his speech, and he mentioned one example about how Hong Kong companies have in one of the Nepal project where they built uh, some facilities in Nepal, mostly by Chinese companies, but also engaged one Hong Kong small consultant in a few of the projects. It ended up that during the earthquake afterwards, all other buildings collapsed, except the one with the Hong Kong input. So, but this company we try to locate it is so difficult because this is just a small consulting firm. And Hong Kong is good in that because we are service-based economy. Most of our service, either they are big companies under the US, Europe, or Japanese title, or increasingly Chinese, or they are only small fish who are doing specialized uh, areas. So it's just hard to put a name on it. Um, so hopefully that can answer part of your question. I'm not saying that we are not contributing, but you have to look at it in a different way. Uh, 